basically all our events recordings from our YouTube channel. If you subscribe, you will see different uh, different meetups and the diversity of topics in machine learning, data science, and artificial intelligence. And we have also, we are putting some workshops there. We'll get additional information in new topics. Yeah, just highly encourage you to join our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, also today, as I mentioned, highly encourage you to finish the program. When you have your, your when you finish the program, you may be able to eligible for our follow up uh, program that we are offering mentorship bootcamp. So mentorship bootcamp we are offering. I will briefly introduce about it. I'll just share screen if hosts enable, enable me. This free program, and we are offering another free program in Python in, the, uh, in this month. If you are able to complete that pro programs, you will have a good enough prerequisite to join mentorship bootcamp. What these programs, our goal is to get you to ready to the job market. And our programs are designed for the needs of industry at Silicon Valley specifically. But I tell you, there's uh, thousands of companies here. And they are all looking for machine learning, science, data science, and artificial intelligence scientists. So it'd be good to get a, a traction, get, get yourself ready with our programs to able to qualify for jobs outside. Our goal is to get people ready for that. And those free programs will give you great understanding and we encourage you to, after free programs, do projects yourself. But for the people, we are also offering projects and from real world. We are working with startups and we are working with universities. We take those projects and you'll be able to complete this project as our mentorship bootcamp. And we have mentors from top, top Silicon Valley companies and Stanford. And we have practice interviews and we have career coaching in there. We are actually going through your resume often and you're, you're getting also practice interview. We are telling you what you need, what you are missing. And we are uh, also, there is a also possibility to do internship with the companies actually we are affiliated with after the program. I just go to a brief outline of the program. So the mentorship bootcamp, it's in seven weeks and we have three modules, NLP, distributed machine learning and deep learning modules. You will have two weeks project in the each one and you will do several projects. And after that, you will have practice interviews in meantime, resume coaching, industry insights. And also we are connecting our students with the recruiters here in Bay Area and all US. So uh, just give you that information, but I encourage you because we get a lot of applications and we have really, really limited uh, space because this is, uh, we assign three, four mentors to small group of students for each, each group. So we, we provide a lot of mentors and instructors, but we have a limited space for it. I encourage you to just do it well in this class and finish this class and others and prepare for interviews that we are, we all make an interview to accept people in, this, uh, in that mentorship bootcamp. Just prepare yourself for this program. Hopefully you'll be able to uh, qualify. And we also prioritize people who join our this free programs and they finish. We prioritize these people first. So I hope you can make it. And I will finish that here. And I will also introduce you Dr. Jaran. He's a professor in Santa Clara University. And he's a junk professor in Kaist University in uh, Korea. And he's uh, also a visiting scientist at Stanford University. He's been working on data uh, last 20 years. He's the one of the best people we can learn machine learning from. Uh, I hope you can uh, take good benefits of learning from him. I just uh, let him start. I hope you enjoy. I'll be teaching this class for the next uh, five weekends. 
And as uh, Dr. Badai said, we are going to have uh, TA support uh, during the weekdays. And uh, my friends are going to let you know when the TA is going to be available with you. I'm going to share some uh, assignments uh, so that uh, you, you can go uh, with the TA uh, step by step on, on the assignments uh, uh, yourself. Uh, if you allow me one more second, I'm going to share the link for the material for this class with you. And every uh, before each class, I'm going to share the link with you so that you can download the material uh, and then and then follow the class. Just one second, I'm going to give you the material. Okay, I just uh, I just uh, shared the link uh, from the chat so you can you can uh, download the material uh, again from time to time. I'm going to share the link because there are so many. Uh, messages in the chat so my voice might be lost so uh, one thing i always remind before so we have been doing this for a while so one thing i remind everybody before we start any program online is uh, is is that uh, when you are uh, following an online program which so many of them are available so many so much of material available you don't have to go to any school or anywhere to learn about machine learning. So much material available. But uh, last year, I just went through the a number of attendees on uh, a machine learning class, and everybody should know about it, right? A Stanford professor, Andrew. So his, his, his machine learning class, which is available for free at Coursera, at YouTube, I just went through the numbers. Uh, and then I wish uh, I had access to my iPad so I could show you the graph. So the first week number of attendees or listeners, I just looked at the YouTube numbers. Uh, first couple of uh, uh, lectures is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, hundred thousands. And then as we move forward uh, after two, three weeks later, uh, the number of uh, people who are actually going through the material is dropping to, uh, I mean, to maybe let's say 30,000. From hundreds, uh, for example, 500,000 to 30,000, 20,000. So the thing what I notice is people uh, start and but they don't go through the material. So it makes a lot of sense if we go through the material uh, until the end. So uh, and then once you're done with that material, you can start with another one. If you jump from one material to another, uh, that's my observation. Uh, students are not getting the much uh, benefit that they could get from the classes. Okay. So this is just an introduction part. It's gonna be very quick. Then we'll, we'll start with uh, uh, supervised uh, learning models uh, very quickly. For this class, uh, we can, we're going to use uh, Anaconda. So you can, I mean, you can easily download uh, Python uh, from Anaconda distribution. So the link is there. And if you guys are interested in machine learning, you might have heard about Anaconda. And then again, from the material, just click on the link and then, and then download the uh, uh, the Jupyter notebook that we're going to be using for this class. The Python knowledge, that is an excellent, excellent uh, material uh, for free available at this link. Uh, again, you can go through this Python data science handbook uh, at your own pace slowly, uh, which is going to give you a good uh, overview of uh, Python, which you can use for data science purposes. And it's an excellent source. And for this class, I'm mainly going to use the class notes uh, and uh, textbook and uh, code examples from Andrew Muller's uh, textbook, Introduction to Machine Learning with Python. It's a very easy to read a book for uh, beginners. Uh, I mean, uh, there are so many nice books out there, but this is, this is a book which is very, very good for, for the beginners. So I'll be using uh, mostly his notes and then code from this textbook. So machine learning is all about capturing knowledge from the data. They are going to capture the patterns uh, in, in the data. Uh, so much of data is available. Uh, so uh, there are different types of machine learning, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. So there are a couple of more types actually, but uh, uh, in the industry, uh, mostly we are using supervised learning and uh, a little bit of unsupervised learning. So in this class, uh, we are going to focus mostly on supervised learning. What is supervised learning? So we have the data uh, and then we have the label for this data. For example, if we are talking about uh, uh, income level of people and we gather data about people, right? Like age or number of years a person spent on education, his zip code, right? 
uh, then this each piece of this data, his age, his number of years he spent in education or his zip code uh, will be uh, the, the attributes or the features of your data set, right? And then what we are trying to estimate for each person is his income. In this case, the income will be the target variable. And uh, when we have data set about individuals, which tells us uh, age, education level, and zip code, in addition to his income, we call this data labeled data. Because in this data, not only we know the features about each individual, but we also know the value of the label or target variable for this individual, each sample in the data set. So we are gonna be using this label or target to train our model so that we can make estimations for individuals that we don't know their income. So that is supervised learning. So we are, we are gonna be using the target variable or the label when we train the model, right? This is supervised learning. When we, sometimes uh, uh, there'll be occasions where we have the data set, we have the features, but we don't have the target variable, right? But in that case, uh, what we're gonna do is without the labels, without any feedback, uh, we are going to try our best to cluster, uh, in this case, the individuals or the, or the samples or the data set. We are going to put data points into groups because we don't know the label, right? We don't know the target variable for each data point. We can only put them into groups. We try, we're try. going to try to find some hidden structure in the data set. In that case, we are going to be using unsupervised learning. Right? So we are using unsupervised learning in the market to determine say market segments, right? So uh, for example, you are running a website and then, uh, so there is, this is one problem that I was talking with uh, a, a platform owner. So they are receiving millions of visitors uh, daily on their website. And some of these people are already subscribed to the website. So they know about these people, right? Uh, they know about their intentions and, but millions of the visitors are not subscribed. They're just visitors. So they don't know their intentions. Are they out there just to read about reviews of the products or are they out there just to actually to buy something, right? So, uh, or are, are they out there to maybe switch from one product to another? So there are different types of people coming to website with different intentions, right? So we don't have the labels for the people coming to the website. So he was looking for, is there any way we can differentiate those visitors and then, uh, I mean, put them into clusters so that I know this type of visitor is actually trying to learn about a product because he wants to buy a new product. Or this person is not happy with this product, but is, is, is most likely going to switch to another product, right? So there are different types of visitors coming to website, but we don't know their types in advance. We need to cluster them based on their behavior on the website, for example. So this is unsupervised learning. Again, in this class, we are going to mostly focus on supervised learning. So as I said, we have the training data and the corresponding labels. Uh, we're gonna feed this label and train data into the machine learning algorithm. And then we're gonna train a model. This predictive model later on will receive new data that we don't know the labels of. And then we're gonna make our predictions. This is the supervised learning. So what we do with supervised learning is from known data points, we are going to form a general model that is gonna help us to make estimations on data points that we don't know the labels of. That is supervised learning. When we have supervised learning models, uh, we are gonna be using these models for two purposes, mainly. One is for classification, the other one is for regression. So we'll be using classification when our target variable or the labels take discrete values. So what is discrete? What does that mean? So I'm teaching a class to students and I want to develop a model based on their performance or based on their attendance. I want to develop a model which is going to help me to estimate whether a person is gonna pass or fail this class, right? Pass or fail, one, zero, yes, no. When the target variable is discrete and it doesn't have to be binary. Binary means taking only two values, right? It can be categorical too, right? In that case, uh, we are going to have a classification algorithm. But if we want to estimate or predict a target variable that is gonna take continuous values, right? Continuous means uh, the available values for a target variable is infinite. 
For example, instead of predicting whether a student is gonna pass or fail a class, is there any way I can actually predict uh, his grade, right? So out of 100, right? Is it gonna be 60 or 61 or 62 or 65 or, or 95, right? So in that case, I will be uh, training a model for regression, right? In this case, my target variable will be a continuous variable. Let me make this bigger. Okay, so classification, I'm going to classify my data points. Uh, in this case, on the screen, you have, uh, you have data points with two attributes, X1 and X2. On the left-hand side, I have uh, a certain data points, let's say negative ones. On the right-hand side, I have positive. So this is, a, uh, this is an example for data points that are linearly separable, right? A linear line is going to help me to separate these two groups of data points. So on the right hand side, this time I have again a data points uh, with uh, some feature, in this case, a single feature X. Y is the uh, label value, label value. So like this is the student, this is his grade, this is the person, this is his income, right? And then I'm trying to come up with a model, in this case, a regression model that is going to help me to estimate or predict, like to predict, let's say, the grade or the income of an individual when a new individual appears that I don't have any information about his, the value of his target variable. I'm just, that's, I don't know his income or I don't know what his grade will be, right? So in that case, I'll be using this line, this regression line to make that prediction. So this is regression model. So based on what data we have, they are going to form a model as general as possible. So we're gonna come back to this model being as general as possible uh, in more detail. So this is just an introduction, an introduction. So we'll deal with these uh, in more detail in a minute. So I said unsupervised models, unsupervised learning, they are trying to cluster uh, or find some uh, pattern in the data set without uh, actually guided by any target variable, right? So here, these data points somehow are close to each other for some reason, right? So then I consider that, uh, I mean, I infer that these data points are within the same cluster. They are similar based on some similarity metric. So, or these guys, guys are similar. In a, another way to use unsupervised learning is we can use it to reduce the dimensionality. So one, when we have so many attributes, so many features of a data set, sometimes uh, it might be helpful to reduce the dimensionality, let's say into two or three, so that I can visualize the data set, or I can remove the noise from the data set, or I can compress the data set so that I can represent the data set in a, in a lower dimension, right? So in that case, again, we're gonna be using unsupervised learning. Again, this is a, just a very uh, regular, uh, ordinary machine learning workflow. We are gonna collect the data set. We are going to clean and transform the data set. They are going to separate a part of the data set for test purposes, which we're, gonna, we're not gonna touch uh, that, that, that test data set. And then we are going to train the model, test our model based on our test data set and deploy the model. We are not gonna stop there. We, are, we, we continue uh, uh, gathering data set and then we are going to go through this loop, uh, depending on the context uh, frequently or, or, or with, some, with some certain frequency, it might be, really frequently, or it might be every month or every year, we may need to update the model based on the new data set that we are collecting. Okay. So when we are representing our data sets for our uh, code, let's, which I'm gonna show you a couple of examples in a minute, just uh, be patient, please. Uh, when we're representing our data sets, we are gonna have, in, for our supervised learning models, we're gonna have two main components. And uh, I mean, uh, by convention, we'll be using the capital letter, capital X for our data set and the small letter Y for our target variable. So this doesn't have to be this way. You can name anything. You can name this label or target. You can name this your data, whatever. But by convention, we are using capital X and small Y. So this, this capital X will be our feature set for samples. So each row will be corresponding to a sample. So if it's the, your subject is a person, each row will be corresponding to a person. Right? 
or a product right or a sale and uh, and uh, as you see each uh, row has multiple columns so each column will be corresponding to a feature okay a feature is in this case for example if the sample is an individual a feature might be his age so another feature another column might be his level of uh, education right or his zip code so some of these values will be numeric continuous some of them will be categorical right so they may take uh, binary values they may take uh, uh, values from multiple categories so we are going to deal with uh, numeric values and categorical values later on so this is our X feature set. And Y will be the corresponding target value. value. This, this is the label or target. So for this one sample, this blue box, the corresponding label is 1.6. Later on, when we are going to shuffle the data set, okay, that's, I mean, if you are doing things manually and when you are shuffling your data set, uh, one mistake that sometimes I see students doing is they are shuffling data set, but they forget to shuffle uh, together. They forget to shuffle the target variable. So the sample and its corresponding label should be moving together. So we will never lose this correspondence, okay? So this, this, this information here is very valuable for us. So this individual, whatever that is, this can be a product or individual, the target value is 1.6. And we are gonna be using this target variables values to clear, to train our supervised model. Okay. okay, so when we are developing our model, we are going to divide our data set mainly into two groups. And later on, we'll see that we are gonna actually gonna be dividing into many different uh, subgroups, but mainly into two groups. We're gonna call them one group as training set, the other one as test set. Okay, so we'll be using training set for training the model. Once we train the model, and only after we train the model, we are going to use this test data set. And this will happen ideally only once. We are going to use our test data set to test how well our model is doing. Okay, I said ideally only once, use the test data set ideally only once. Then you might ask, uh, how am I gonna know my model is doing, right? When I'm training my model. So for that purpose, actually, we're gonna actually divide our training data set into two further groups. So one group I'll call it training set, the other group I'll call it validation set. So I'm gonna be using that validation set to see how well my model is trained. And then I'm gonna use that validation set to set certain parameters of my model. Okay. And then we'll come to that again in, in our examples. So if, uh, uh, this brief and maybe boring introduction is uh, is enough. So let's let's just uh, look at some some examples. Uh, for let's start from very basics on how we can load the data set using pandas, and uh, sometimes we'll be using data sets that are already available at Scikit-learn, uh, some uh, toy data sets. So how we can also upload these data sets and then how we can work with them. So I'm just going to. Uh, can I see this? Okay, so yeah, this is our first uh, uh, Jupyter notebook. As I said, I'll be using uh, Jupyter notebook for uh, uh, this class. Uh, you can use uh, other sources too. So I'm using Colab for when I'm teaching deep learning to, to students, but for machine learning uh, and for introductory machine learning, I'm using Jupyter Notebook. And uh, you can easily uh, write your code and then run your code and then see the results uh, immediately on the screen uh, on the same uh, platform actually. So it's very useful, very convenient. So I like using it. Uh, so. For this uh, exercise, we are gonna learn about how we can load uh, data sets from, uh, from files. If your file is, has an extension of CSV, right? So for that, we'll be using pandas read underscore CSV uh, function for that, right? So we are, for that, we need to first import pandas. 
and uh, I am going to uh, load my data set from pandas uh, using uh, pandas read underscore CSV. So this is my data set, okay, my whole data set. All right, so this data set now includes both X, capital X and Y, my feature set, as well as my, uh, uh, my target variable, right? So after you load, let's load the data set. Let's go step by step. And by the way, after I go, I go through this, because there is a small exercise. So I'm gonna pause a little bit and then I'm gonna go through that exercise with you step by step. So this is for uh, just for illustration, then we're gonna go through the exercise together. So now I'm loading my, my data sets. Again, I'm using pandas read CSV. There are different ways of loading data sets. So I'm just showing you how to load with pandas. Once we load our data set, the first thing, one of the first things actually we should do is check the first five data points and then how they look like, what are the column names, what kind of values these guys are taking, right? just to see how our data set looks like. So for that, I'll be using head data. Now our data set is a data frame, right? Data set is a data frame, Panda data frame. So I'll be using head uh, to see the first five, data points in our data frame. So yeah, we have age, work class. So this is a survey uh, data set. We have people at each row, individuals, and then we have age, work class, education, number of years in education. So these are the features. Some of the features are, as you see, numeric and continuous, and some of the features are categorical and discrete. So work class is, is, is taking discrete values. Education is taking discrete values, right? but age is taking continuous values. So later on, again, we are gonna deal with these categorical variables because as of now, uh, I cannot use this data set to train my, say, regression model. I have to turn, say, race, gender, relationship, occupation. I have, I have to turn these features into numeric values, right? I have to encode them so that I can use them in my model. Okay. So another thing that I should do as one of the first things I should do after I check the, how my data looks like, the first five data points, I should also see how many data points I really have, right? How many observations I have and how many actually features I have. For that, I'll be checking, um, I'll be using shape, right? Data.shape. So this will give me number of observations and number of features, right? So, Number of observations, 32,561. I have 32,000 of observations, 32,000 rows. And I also have 14 columns, 14 features. Okay. So another thing that later on you might be using, again, in the examples uh, in our next class or next, next class we'll be using, uh, you might need to you know, store your column names, right? So that's another useful thing to look at. So you can simply, I mean, assign your column names. These are the column names, age, work, class, education. These are the column names. You can assign them to another variable and then later on, you can use that variable for different purposes to slice your data set, right? Or create uh, uh, transformers, right? For that, you might need, you need your data, data columns. So that is another useful uh, uh, function to know data.columns method actually, it's gonna give you the uh, list of the uh, columns in your data set. Okay, now uh, these are all part of the pre-processing. I'm thinking to give one lecture on pre-processing actually in more detail how we can pre-process the data set. So another useful thing is if your data points, some of your data points are, uh, I mean, uh, discrete, taking discrete values, right? So you might wonder, how many, for example, for example, let's look at, look at our income. Income has actually two values. It's taking only two values, less than 50K or greater than 50K. So you don't see greater than 50K, but I know that there is another value for income, which is greater than 50K. So I might wonder how many of the samples, right, is less than 50K and how many of them are greater than 50K, right? So for that, you might just count number of, uh, values, different values, unique values in your data set. So this data is my whole data set, my whole data frame. So I can have access to individual columns. I'm just going to focus on income, right? 
income, this column. And then I'm just going to count number of different values in that column, value underscore counts. So this will give me in my data data frame for my income feature, how many uh, of each unique value I have for income feature. So I have 24,000 less than 50K and 7,800 for greater than 50K. Okay, so this, I'm just trying to understand how my data looks like. Okay, so I'm just uh, exploring my data. All right, so without running any machine learning algorithm, uh, going through this exploration actually uh, might help you a lot to understand what this data set is about and it might give you some ideas, right? Some insight about this. For example, about this data set, again, let's focus on our income because this is basically our target variable. Later on, I'm gonna separate income from my data set and assign income to Y. So uh, I'm also just curious, right? How this income is distributed across different ages? Because I have an age feature here. Where is that? Here, right? I'm just curious, right? So uh, if uh, out of all these people who have less than 50K, how are their ages distributed? And out of people who have income more than 50K, how are their ages are distributed? So I just want to see that. So for that, what we can do is we can group by our data based on, in this case, income. When I say data that group by, what this is gonna do is this is gonna separate this data set into two groups. One group will be those who have income less than 50K. The other group will be those who have income greater than 50K. Right? So then what I can do is for those who have less than 50K, I can take a histogram of the age for that group. Right? So once I can group my data set right here, I grouped my data set by income. Right? So then next thing is I'm gonna focus on the age attribute of the first group, let's say the first group, which is less than 50K. And then I'm gonna take the histogram of the ages of this first group. So this histogram is going to divide my data set into bins and then for each bin, I'm just going to observe the frequency of that bin, right? So for example, for those who have great income less than 50K, right, I see that most of those guys have age around 20, right? And then as age advances from 20 to 80, as you see, the frequency is dropping. That means those who have income less than 50K, as they get older, right? number of people who have income less than 50K is also decreasing. That's what it says. So most of the people who have income less than 50K are actually their ages are focused around between 20 and let's say 40. Okay, that's what it says, the data says. So now let's look at the other group, which is income greater than 50K. Again, I'm looking at their age and then histogram of their age. And it shows a nice Gaussian distribution actually, right? almost like normal, normally distributed, uh, a normal distribution, right? Normal distribution is a symmetric distribution centered around the mean, right? In this case, uh, I mean, most of the people actually who have less than, uh, I'm sorry, greater than 50K, their age is centered around 42, right? So I have really small number of people whose age is around 20 and have income greater than 50K. And I have people, again, small number of people whose age is greater than 60 and also have an income greater than 50K. Most likely these guys are retired. These guys are very young, right? To make that much income. And these people are working, right? They have a job, they're working and they're making greater than 50K, right? So again, without even looking at anything, I had a good idea about my data set. So without running any algorithm, if you tell me the age of that person, I might make a good guess about his income actually, right? So if you tell me this person is 20 years old, most likely his income is less than 50K. If you tell me someone around 45 years old, well, uh, it's almost like equally, right? Equal like that this person might have less than or greater than 50K, right? Okay, so next thing is once I go through my data, and then by the way, there are so many other things we can do here. As I said, I'm gonna have a separate session on pre-processing. 
Uh, next thing is I'm just going to split my data into two groups, my feature set and my target variable. X will be my feature set, Y will be my target variable. What I'm gonna do is again, I'm gonna use my data frame. This time I'm just going to drop income from my data. So I still keep my data. My data is still here with 14 features. What I'm gonna do is I'm just going to drop income from my data and then the remaining 13 features I'm gonna assign them to X, okay, here. X is all my data features except income. And I'm just going to assign income to Y. So Y is gonna be income, X will be all features excluding the target variable. So if you like, you can just check how your X looks like. As you see, income is disappearing now. So this is my feature set. And this is my target variable Y, okay. This is the first five, uh, all right. <clears throat> Next, I'm just going to split my data set as I try to show you here, right? I'm sorry, this one, right? I'm just going to split my data set into two pieces, training and test data set. Now, you can split your data set, uh, but when you're splitting the data set into two pieces, you have to do this randomly, right? So you need to pick random samples from your data set and then assign them to training and then the rest will be assigned to the test data set, right? So you can do this, uh, you can write the code for this manually, which is not very difficult, but we are using in this class mostly scikit-learn and scikit-learn already provides us with a class that will help us to make this train test split, right? So what we're gonna do is we are going to import train test split class from scikit-learn's model selection library and I'll be using train test splits to split my data sets X and Y exactly from the same locations into two pieces. So by default, this split is gonna be 25% to 75%. So 75% will be uh, my training data set, 25% will be my test data set. Okay, so one, uh, I mean, just, just for a note here, uh, when you are listing train test and train test, make sure that you list X train and X test and then Y train and Y test, otherwise it's giving error. So uh, this, this order might differ from for, for some other libraries, but for train test split, it's X train, X test, Y train and Y test. Okay, so I split my data set into two pieces. Now I can look at the first five observations as you see, the first five observations indices are very different. Look at the first five observations indices. I'm starting from my first data point, which is zero. Index is zero, index is zero. Then index is one, then index. My data is, it has some order here, right? Zero, one, two, three, the indices. Because when I split my data set, I'm splitting it randomly. As you see, the indices are totally random now. So the first data point in my test the train data set is the index is 24,900. Okay, so this is my train data set because it is 75% of the total data set, uh, total number of data points. I have now 24,000 data points in my train data set. All right, so up to this point, we learned how to upload data and uh, slide, take a slice of that data sets. And then we learned how to split this data set into uh, train and test data points. So let's go through this small exercise here and then we'll do the same things in a different data set. Okay, so let's do this one. I also uh, gave you the data set for this exercise, Boston House Prices data set. So I'll use that data set. Okay, so we are going to load Boston House Prices. So in my, uh, in my case, my data is in this folder, data folder, as you see, data folder. So, uh, but in your case, your data is in the same folder with your file. So just keep this in mind. If your data is another folder, you have to give the path to your data set. Okay, so let's start. We are going to import, and you can also do the exercise with me step by step. We are going to import pandas first. And then I'm just going to use an abbreviation for that. You don't have to do this, but it's gonna make your job easier. 
So I'm going to be using pandas, and I know that I will be uh, splitting my data set into train and test. So I'm just going to import uh, from scikit-learn, right? And model selection library. I will be importing my train test split class. Okay. So these are the two uh, uh, libraries that I will be importing. If you want to uh, add another cell which you can type your code, we're just going to click on this one. Okay. So this is my first. And then if you want to run this uh, for Mac, you can use the shift and return. Okay. Or you can select this cell and then click on this one. So I'll be using shift and return. Okay. And two. This is oops. Just one second. So we don't say import, we say from, so I, I mean, they just typed it wrong. So you should say from scikit one model selection. So, okay, so I imported the, uh, my pandas and train to split. Next thing is I'm going to load my data sets. So let's call it data. You can call it anything, your data, my data, data one, data two. And as I said, I'm just going to be using pandas for that. For pandas, I'll be using PD abbreviation, and then I will read my data set. Okay, so where is my data set located? I know that my data set is here in this folder data. So yours, you don't need it, or wherever it is located, you can just find it. And then the name of my data set is Boston. House. Prices, okay, dot CSV. Okay. All right. Now uh, it says uh, can we check uh, how many data points we have, how many columns we have, uh, right? So can we just uh, print that here? So I think we can do it. So let's first load this data set. Okay, our data set is loaded. So now let's uh, just use print to print this information. So I'm just going to print. So let's, let's print number of samples. Okay. Now I'm just going to use a placeholder here. And this placeholder uh, uh, will hold the place for my, uh, for, for number of samples variable which which will come in a moment okay so this is number of samples and then uh, i will also have number of features so let's hold this place here okay uh, and let's let that's enough number of samples is this number of features is this of using string formatting okay so and then for number of samples I am going to take my data. Remember, I can print the shape of my data, right here. Data dot, dot shape is gonna give me this uh, tuple, right? The first one corresponds to number of observations. The second one corresponds to number of features. So that's what I'm gonna do. By the way, let me show you. If you say data dot shape right it's going to give you a number of observations and number of features if you say data that shape zero right so it's going to give you only number of observations because data that shape is a tuple sorry it's a tuple with two elements the first one has the index of zero the other one has the index of one so if i say data shape one then it's going to be 14 right so data that shape zero this, this one, data that shape zero will correspond to number of samples, right? And then 
one will correspond to number of features. So, let's uh, make this move nicely. Okay, so my number of samples is 506 and my number of uh, features is uh, 14. Okay, so if you like, you can print number of, uh, uh, print the columns. So let's say columns, okay. And then remember, I can print the columns, right? What, how, how, how can I list the column names? Remember, so this is my data. And then I have a method. Data is a data frame as of now. And data frame comes with it all, its own methods, its own functions, right? So one of those methods is columns. What is this? This lists the names of the columns. So if you wonder what are these columns, here are the columns. These are the names of the columns in my data set. By the way, you can also make the first five observations. These are the names of the columns and these are my observations. So most likely this guy here is a categorical variable. Um, and the others look like the look like uh, continuous variables. Okay. What else are they asking? So this is a regression data set. Regression data set means the, the, the target variable is continuous, okay? And MEDV, median value of the house price is, is the target variable, okay? How many features are there? How many samples? We already answered that question. So let's split the data set. So let's first split into X and Y. So again, this is my data. I'm just going to drop uh, median house price, right? The name is MEDV, MEDV. I just drop it. Then you drop, uh, you need to also say, are you dropping a column or are you dropping a row, right? I'm dropping a column, so I can say axis is one. So that means I'm dropping a column, right? And then Y is, again, my data. And this time you can simply say data dot. Okay, so this is my X and, and Y. So we say Y dot. You see, these are the first five observations from my median house price. Okay. Next thing is, uh, let's now split my data set into train and test data set. So X train, remember which one comes next? X test, right? And Y train, then Y test. Okay, so I already loaded train test split. So that's what I'm gonna use, train test splits. Now I'm gonna be splitting my data set X and Y together, okay? X and Y, all right? So after the splits, if you want to see what is your train data sets dimensions, right? Number of features and rows. So I can say X train dot shape, same thing. This time 75% of my data sets will be included in the train data set. Okay. One last thing it says, asks me to do, after you split your data set, can you plot median house price versus any of the features using the plot method of the data frame using scatter? So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, make a scatter plot of my uh, data set for median house price and one of the features that I select. Okay, so let's do it. By the way, this data frame comes with methods. I said one of the methods is, is plot method. So you can do this again in various ways, but this is a, a very simple way to do it. So this is my data set. Remember the, my original data set? It's a data frame. It comes with this method, which is called plot. So this plot will help me to plot graphs, right? So what am I gonna do is I'm going to create a scatter plot of median house price and say number of rooms. So what is your expectation? When number of rooms increases, I expect median house price also increase, right? 
Okay. Number of rooms. I'm going to plug this versus median house price. And so this can be any plot. So the kind of the plot that I'm looking for is scatter plot. Right. So let's see. So this is room number. This is median house price. As we expected, as room number is increasing, median house price is increasing. It's there's almost a linear relationship, right? So again, as part of uh, pre-processing, we're going to deal with this frequently. Uh, we are going to create scatter plots of pairs of uh, uh, feature and the target variable to see what kind of relationship uh, target variable and the feature has. If it is linear, if not, should we transform our uh, feature to make it look more linear or more Gaussian or more normally distributed? So all that will be part of the Preprocess. Okay, so let me give like a uh, stop here for five minutes and then I will continue with uh, the next uh, uh, example and then uh, we'll continue with the uh, with, with supervised learning. Just five minutes break, okay. I said we can load data set using pandas. We can also load data set using uh, from scikit-learn's uh, uh, data sets. So from time to time uh, for learning purposes, we might use these data sets. Uh, these toy data sets. So in this case, I'm just going to load uh, uh, some digits, uh, handwritten digits from uh, scikit-learn's data sets. So these digits are similar to or, or transformed uh, images from uh, MNIST data set, which is a very popular data set for image recognition. And uh, for loading data sets from scikit-learn, we are going to import load digits, load underscore digits from scikit-learn, okay? So in this case, uh, I mean, uh, the data set is load digits. If it is uh, another data set that we are loading, uh, the name will change. So from scikit-learn data sets, we are loading digits data set. Okay, later on, I think there is another data set, load cancer. We're gonna be using that data set as well in our exercises. Okay, uh, so I'll be dealing with uh, Arrays in this case, so I'm importing NumPy, and for NumPy, I'll be using NPS the abbreviation. And uh, to load the digits, to load the data sets, load digits, you can simply call this function load digits. So it will load the data set to, uh, to, to, uh, to your screen, but I'm going to assign this data set to a variable and then I call it digits. So digits is now. Uh, it's now coming with uh, five things actually. So it's a dictionary, it's a Python dictionary, and it has uh, keys and values. So the keywords is are data, targets, target names, images, and description in this case. So I have the data and target already available. So I don't need to split my data into X and Y. It is already given as split from the cyclic learning. So I'm giving this part of the lecture in this way because uh, when we are using when we are using scikit-learn data sets, sometimes students are confused. Uh, so that's why I'm just telling in advance that data is already coming in in this format. If you want to see what this data set is about, you can take digits. Remember, digits is holding the the dictionary, and description is the name of the keyword. Uh, the, it's, this is this description about the data set. And uh, this is the value for description. So just give some information about what this data is about. Okay. So you can have access to data. So digits, remember, is the dictionary. Data is the data set in, in uh, the value. Data is the name of the keyword. And then digits.data is the value corresponding to data keyword, which is the data set. And this is the shape of that data set. So we have 1,790 observations with 64 features and target variable is 1797. So what are what what is this target and what is this data? How do they look like? If you if you want to see how they look like, so you can simply print your target variable. As you see, target is just numbers from zero to nine actually. Zero, one, two, these are digits, nine digits. Okay, so that means we have a categorical variable in the target, right? Our label or target variable is a categorical variable with nine 
in, in 10 different categories actually, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So if you want to see how many of each of these category values in your target variable, in other words, how many unique, uh, how many each of these unique values, uh, how many samples correspond to each of these unique values, you can simply make bin count. Okay, so you're actually dividing your data set into bins, and then you are counting how many for each bin. So again, bin count is a method coming from with NP. NP is NumPy, we already imported it, right? That's why we imported it actually. So I can bin count my target uh, variable, which is coming with my digits dictionary. So in this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I have 10 categories. And these are the numbers of samples for each category. In other words, I have 178 zeros and 182 ones. Okay. And I can, uh, again, uh, take only one sample from my data set. If I do data zero, this is only one sample. This is the first sample in my data set. And I have 64 features for this first sample. All right. I know that this data set is numbers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this, uh, my, my feature set into a matrix. So I'm gonna make it look like a matrix, okay? So again, remember this is my uh, first uh, sample from my data set with 64 features. I'm going to turn the 64 features into eight by eight matrix. So what I'm gonna do is first, I'm gonna choose my first sample, which is 64 features, and then I'm gonna reshape it by eight by eight. So reshape eight by eight will put this 64 features into eight by eight matrix. And then I'm just checking whether I did it correct or not. So looking at checking the shape of this reshaped first sample, which is eight by eight. Why did I do that? Because I'm going to use this to, uh, in this case, just to, to, just to plot. So to see how it looks like, okay. So for plotting, uh, I mean, there are different, uh, again, uh, tools available for plotting, but we'll be using matplotlib, dot pyplot and PLT. Again, by convention in most uh, textbooks, you will see this, uh, we are using PLT for abbreviation of, for matplotlib. So what we're gonna do is uh, we are going to just plot my first digit and see how it looks like. When I'm plotting this, okay, when I'm plotting this, I am preferring to plot it in, in, in tones of gray. Actually, my data set as of now is composed of numbers, each number corresponding to a pixel. And each pixel is taking numbers from zero to 255. So, but in this case, uh, the data set is uh, transformed, so it's not, exact zero to 255, I know that. So it is uh, transformed uh, to make it look more simpler. But depending on the value of the pixel, uh, I will be assigning a gray tone so that I can plot the image, right? So in this case, my image is, as you see, a zero. It's not a very clear zero, but it's a zero, right? So okay, if you like, uh, if you like, you can, you can plot it in, in a different color. So that's why I put it here. Uh, this is the color map, okay? So I used grays and, and blues. So the second one is uh, in, in blue tone, okay. The corresponding target value for this first sample is zero. As you said, this is my first sample. And this is the target variable. So this is the label for this first sample. So I know from my data set that this first sample is zero. Okay. Well, if you like, you can create subplots, right? Subplots, in this case, I only have a single plot. If you like, you can divide a single figure into subplots, and then you can put more number of uh, figures, I'm sorry, plots in the same figure. So what I'm gonna do is, this is one single figure, but in, on this figure, I'm gonna have, uh, how many? 16 uh, numbers listed. So for that, I'm, I'm, I'll be running a for loop, Right, so my for loop is going to take one sample, 
Now, this is the first sample, this is the second sample, this is the third sample, and I'm also showing their corresponding labels on top of the figures, okay? All right, so this is my data set. Next thing is I'm just going to split my data set as I did before into two pieces, X-Train and X-Test. Again, actually two main pieces, train and test data set. Again, remember digits data is X, digits target is Y. So there is one additional thing you see here, which, which we didn't have before, test underscore size. Before we didn't use it, because we use the default value. The default value for splitting data into two pieces, train test split is 2575 split, okay? If you like, you can change this ratio. So this is the parameter to make that change. Again, your test size in this case 0.25, if you like, you can make this 10, right? So in this case, 90% of your data will be trained, 10% will be test. So let's turn it back to 25. And I have another parameter here, random state one. So this is uh, when you are training a model and uh, when you want to replicate your experiments or when you want some other person run the, your code and get the same results. So you need to fix the random C, right? So what is random C? Remember when we are splitting data into train and test data sets, we are doing this randomly. We are sampling, taking random samples from our data set and assigning them into train and test groups, right? Randomly. So when we are making this random samples, that randomness is coming from a sequence of random numbers that is generated by, are generated by the computer. So by setting, so each seed, each seed number, in this case, random state, corresponds to a certain sequence of random numbers. So if I set the random state to one, I will have a certain sequence of random numbers and that sequence will be fixed. If I change this to random state two, I will have another sequence of random numbers. And every time I set random state equals two, I will have the same sequence of random numbers. So this way we can replicate the experiments or we can replicate uh, I mean, get the same results for the same model. If you don't set your random state to one, in this case, I mean, the data set, every time you run this, every time you run this, your train and test data set will be different. Okay, because every time you run this without setting random state equals one, uh, a different uh, random sequence, sequence of random numbers will be used to split your data set, okay. As you see the same things, you can check the shape of your train and test data sets. Uh, let's do the same exercise. I mean, same things. Uh, this time let's load the uh, iris data set, which is another toy data sets that we are using in our, in our examples. So we'll do the same thing for this time load, uh, loading the iris data set. Let's, so let's do it. So I'm just going to load this from scikit-learn. Okay, so I will be importing this time loading my iris data set. Okay, earlier it was digit data. Iris is the name of the data set. Okay, and then I'm going to be splitting uh, my data set. So so I'll be splitting my data set. This is coming from model selection. What? Okay, so these are the two uh, imports that I need. So next, let's import the data sets. It's very simple. I'm just going to assign the name Iris. You can use any name, but uh, this part has to be the same, load Iris, right? I'm calling this function to load my data set. Again, remember Iris is a, is a dictionary now, so the easiest way to assign X and Y, you can do this, is uh, X and Y will be actually iris data and iris target, okay? So this is X is my data, Y is my target because iris is already coming with data and target. 
Okay. All right. Now, if you like, you can simply print the size of your uh, data set. So, set size is this. Okay. And your number of features. Let's use be consistent. This. Right. Let's also this time because I know that target variable for IDIS data set is a categorical data set. Number of classes, how many classes, different classes do we have? So let's also use it, okay? These are the placeholders, let's be consistent, okay? All right, dot, I'm using string formatting. So the first one, data set size, remember data set size, x dot shape, right? Is gonna return a tuple. Tuple has two components. First component is number of observations. Second component is number of columns, right? Or features. Okay, X shape, this is data set size. And then X dot shape. The second one will be number of features. The third one will be interesting, number of classes. I need to find unique number of values, right? In my categorical variable, which is Y unique number of values. So for that, I'll be using NumPy unique. So then I need to import NumPy, right? Yes, NP. Let's run this one more time. Did I make them? Okay. All right, so let's find the unique number of values in my target variable. Okay, for that, I'm just going to find the length. So let's, let's, let me write this separately. So, so I'm just going to list the unique elements of my target variable, okay? And the unique. You see, my target variable has three unique numbers. Zero, one, two, I mean. Oh, it's a NumPy array, so it doesn't have a head, so it's not a data frame anymore. Three, one, two. So as you see, my target variable, the first 10 elements of my target variable are all zeros. So I don't know uh, how about 110 and 120. So between 110 and 120, I have all twos. Basically my data is sorted out based on, based on my target values, target variables values, right? First zeros, then ones, then twos which is dangerous by the way, okay? So I have so many of zero to zero, so many of ones and so many of twos in my data set in terms of target variable. So I'm just curious how many different target values target variable is taking. So that's why I'm, I'm checking this unique Y is going, it takes zero, one and two. These are the three different values your target variable can take. Now, I would like to print number of classes. So for that, I'm just going to take the length of this, right? This is a this is a list. This is an array, actually. I'm just going to check the length of this array, which is three. So that's what I'm going to write here: length of. Okay. Okay. I think it's going to work. Yeah. So my data set has 150 observations. There are four features, and there are three classes. All right. Okay, now it's time to split the data set, right? X train, Y, let's call it X train, X test, Y train, Y test, okay? Equals train test split. All right, and I have my X and Y, okay? You can 
again, inc include this uh, test size, random state, if you like. We can even say, instead of test size, you can say train size, which is not gonna make any difference. Whatever your test size, train size will be one minus that number, right? By the way, this number should be between zero and one. It's the ratio. Okay, so we have the X train and X test. Okay. Now, if you like, we can make a scatter plot. So let's do it. For that, we need to import matplotlib. So import pi plots. Okay, as plt. So this is my uh, plot library, right? I imported this. And then I'm just going to uh, plot plt. So remember earlier we used plot method of a data frame. So let me go all the way up here, right? We used plot method of data frame. What is data frame? Data frame is our here data. Data frame is like a, a, think of it as an Excel table, but it also comes with certain functionalities. So this data is like an Excel table with observations and columns, but it also comes with some functionalities. What kind of functionalities? For example, I can see what is the shape of this data set. I can list the number of columns. I can see the first five observations. I can drop a certain column. And I can also plot, make plots from this frame. So these are all functionalities of this data frame. Okay, now we're gonna learn about how we can make scatter plot using a, 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 a plotting uh, library, matplotlib. Okay, so we are using a different tool now. So this is a plot and then it is a scatter plot. Okay, and I'm just curious, right? How uh, one feature uh, versus another feature, how they look like, okay? Whether those features are uh, correlated or not. For example, for example, if you go back to your house here, right? So this is your data. Remember this is our house data set. This is the target variable. You could uh, wonder if age of house and let's say room numbers, how are they, how are they re related? For example, old houses, do they have more number of rooms or less number of rooms? If you're just curious about this, right, you can have a scattered plot of two features, how they are correlated, okay? For example, tax versus, what is that? Crime rate. So for low crime rate places, how is the tax numbers changing, right? So. I would expect that low crime rate places will have high tax because those places will be uh, houses with, I mean, higher prices than high tax numbers will be appearing, right? So there should be some, some correlation between crime and tax. Okay. So I'm just gonna check if there is some correlation between two features of my train data set. So for that, I'm gonna pick the first feature. So. My train data set is a NumPy array. So this is the entire column, the first column. This is the entire observations for the first column. Entire observations means oh, it's a so I have 112 observations. So I'm taking the entire set of 112 observations for the first feature. So I'll do the same thing for the other feature. Okay. Again, the entire column, the first feature. So this is gonna be a scatter plot, but on top of that, I'm gonna do something more. So if you just do this, Yeah, this is, uh, this is one feature, this is another feature. And then what you see is these points are your target variables, okay? These points are, so this is class zero, this is class one, this is class two, so zero, one, two. So, but right now I don't know which data point belongs to which class, right? I don't know that, I cannot see that. This figure only shows me a scatter plot of one feature 
versus another, like room number versus age of the house, right? So this is the this is one feature in my iris data set. This is another feature, and these points are my target variables, right? These are the categories zero, one, two. Remember the categories here. These categories zero, one, two, right? So I can add some extra information on this plot. What I'm gonna do is I'm just going to use my color map. Okay, and then uh, I'm just going to use my train data set. Okay, for my color map. So what's, what's gonna happen is these data points now will take different colors. So in this case, we'll take one of three different colors depending on the value of the train data set. Okay, so let's see. As you see, now I have three different colors each color corresponding to a different class because I know that there are three cl classes, right? And now this plot is more helpful, right? So I not only see how these two features with respect to each other, right, are changing, but also I, I see when I see those two features, how the uh, uh, observations are clustered, right? So I have one cluster here, I have another cluster here, and I have a third cluster here. Okay, now, I can do something more on top of this, right? What I can do is, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see, uh, I only can see two features because this is a two dimensional figure, right? So what I can do is I can add one extra piece of information to this graph, okay? So let's see if I can do it. And so I'm, I'm gonna include one more information about the third feature, uh, right? And that, that, that information is going to be the following. Depending on the value of the third feature, right now I have only two features in this graph. Depending the, on the value of the third feature, these data points will look like big or small. If the third feature's value is big, this data point will be a big circle. If it's small, it's gonna be a small feature. So the color will tell me which class it belongs to. And the size of the uh, circle will tell you what is the size for the third feature for this data points, okay? So I'm adding some extra information here. So let's see. For that, I'll be using size, and this will be the times. So I'm just amplifying the size. Hopefully, this is going to work. So I'm just trying this one here. So I hope it's going to work. Yeah. So let's make this 10. Maybe it's too big. Yeah, so it's much better now. So as you see, I added a third component to my uh, figure. So in addition to X1 and X2, the first two features, I'm also showing the third feature in terms of uh, the size of the circles. So if the circles are big, I know that I know that the third feature for these guys are bigger than the third feature for this guy. So not only, so I know that the purple group somehow are taking small values for the third feature. So this index two is corresponding to the third feature, zero, one, two. So I know that the green ones are taking uh, bigger values than the purple, but smaller values than the yellow group for the third feature. So this is also some additional information about the, okay. So I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, start with the second part of the uh, lecture now, okay. Again, I couldn't somehow connect my iPad. Uh, normally I'm uh, writing equations uh, or, or taking notes on the uh, PDF file as I'm teaching, but anyway, so let's go with whatever is available. Okay, so let's begin with supervised learning. I may not finish this today, because I'm planning to stop in 10 minutes. 
Uh, I'll, I'll continue with this one. So we are really getting started to real stuff now, okay? So we know what supervised learning is. So we have some idea. With supervised learning, we have the feature set and also the target variable, right? The label, actually. So that target value or label value uh, will guide us when we are training the model. The simplest uh, algorithm that we begin with for machine learning uh, classes is K nearest neighbor, okay? K nearest neighbor. I'm gonna talk about what K refers to. So what happens here is when I have a trained data set, in this case, uh, this is a classification problem. On the screen, you see a toy data set plotted. I have a classification problem. I have blue class and red class. So the data points you see with color are my training data points. Why training data points? Because I know their classes. So these guys, I know that they are blue. These guys, I know that they are red. I also have three data points, which I don't know their classes. So that is my goal, right? I'm gonna train a model, which is going to help me to predict the classes for these three data points. So nearest neighbor is, uh, is, 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 is a very simple, it's, it's, the idea is very simple, uh, but for large data sets, it's not very feasible. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, algorithm. So what happens is uh, for when you train the model, training a model is very simple. You just memorize the data set. Okay. Training is just take the train data set into memory. When it, when it comes to prediction, okay, what happens is if you have these three data points, when it comes to prediction, what you're going to do is, for example, for this data point, I'm going to measure the distance between this data point and all other data points in my training data set. Okay, and I'm gonna pick the closest one. Okay, and then I'm gonna predict that this guy here that I don't know his color, this guy actually belongs to, in this case, blue, because blue is the closest one. Now, K nearest neighbor, in this case, K is one. I am only checking his nearest one neighbor, K is one. If it was two, then I'll be checking nearest K, two neighbors. One thing, please keep in mind for K nearest neighbor, K, we prefer taking odd numbers because, for example, focus on this guy, the nearest neighbors are this, let's say this and this. So how are we gonna predict which class this data point belongs to? Two blue, one red, you're gonna take the majority vote, right? So for that reason, we are using K, uh, odd numbers, odd numbers for K, okay. So we are going to, as you see, we are going to predict the classes for these data points that we don't know their class of as of now as the class of the nearest neighbor. Again, training is very simple. Just memorize the data points. Prediction, you're gonna calculate distance. And how do you calculate distance? There are different metrics to do that. Uh, so you can take the absolute value of the difference. You can take the square root of, uh, squared of the summation of square of the, the uh, I mean, uh, difference between the features of the data points. This is called, uh, this is another distance metric, Manhattan distance metric, right? So different distance metrics you can actually use. Okay, so going back to our train and test data set, we have a train, we have a test data set. We already split our data into two pieces. Okay, how do we do this with scikit-learn? I just showed you how to do that, right? This part, we know that, right? We can split our data set into train and test. All right, how do we train a model using scikit-learn? Okay, that is the next thing, which we also have some exercises about that. So for that, I'm going to import from neighbors library. Scikit-learn has neighbors library. I'm gonna import K neighbors classifier class. Okay, K neighbors classifier. Okay, you can also have K neighbors regressor. Okay, this is K neighbors classifier. All right, so I'm gonna take this class and I am going to instantiate this class for a certain number of neighbors. In this case, number of neighbors is one. That's what I did here. Number of neighbors is one. Now, 
n underscore neighbors. This is the hyperparameter of the model. Hyperparameter of the model. A big part of training the models is tuning up hyperparameters. What does that mean? For this model, what number should I use for number of neighbors? One or three or five or seven so that my classifier is going to be the best I can get. Okay, that is hyperparameter tuning. So I instantiate my k-neighbor classifier. KNN is the name of that instance. You can name this anything. My KNN, your KNN, KNN1, KNN2. Okay, this is the instant, name of the instant object for this KNN classifier for this hyperparameter value. All right, next. The moment you instantiate this object, the estimators at scikit-learn and other libraries too, the estimator for scikit-learn comes with three main methods. Okay, fit, score, predict. So for most of the estimators, I mean for all, all estimators, we're gonna have fit, score, and predict these three methods. So what is fit? Fit is the method that is going to help you to train the model. So KNN.fit. So for fitting the model, for training the model, I'll be using my train data set, X train and Y train. So for K neighbors classifier, fit simply takes the train data set into memory. So what does that mean? I am going to only memorize. This is the data point and this is his color. This is the data point and this is, when I say this is the data point means this is his X1 and this is his X2 feature value and it is a blue data point. Okay, I memorized the data point. That is what key neighbors classifies training part does. Okay. Once you fit your model, okay, the next thing is you can test your model on your test data set. So that is what's happening here, KNN.score. But when you are testing your model, you'll be using the test data set, okay? So KNN.score, X test, Y test, is going to return a score value. We call it, in this case, accuracy. What is that score? In this case, let's say I have three data points in my test data set. This guy is blue. This guy is blue. This guy is blue. All three are blue in reality, okay? Their ground truth, true label values are blue. I know that. That is what supervised learning is about. I know the label values. I only test how well my model is doing by comparing the predictions my model is making with the true label values that I have, okay? So I now run my prediction. My prediction says this is blue, this is blue, and this is red. In reality, the true label values were blue, blue, and blue, but my predictions are blue, red, blue. So what is my accuracy? I correctly estimated two out of three. My accuracy is two out of 3.66. Right? So that is what actually this part does. KNN.score will return accuracy. By the way, we're gonna talk a lot about this accuracy, different types of metrics when the time comes. Okay. Not only that, you can also run predict method. What is predict method? So you, let's say you trained your model, you tested your model. Now it is time to deploy the model. So now you are happy with your model and you deployed a new data point allied, a new data point allied and just landed here. So let's say there is a new data point here. Okay. Can you write here? Okay, anyways, a new data point arrives here. Now I would like to predict, okay, what is the class for this data point? Is it blue or red? So that predict method will return the predicted, estimated, the predicted class for this new data point. Okay, that is the, that is the predict uh, method. Okay. If you have more number of neighbors, the predictions will change. Look, this is red, this is blue, 
and this is blue when you are using k equals one k neighbors when you are using the nearest one neighbor to make your predictions when you take into account three neighbors look it was it is red blue and blue now i'm taking into account three neighbors this guy it was predicted as red when i incorporate three neighbors it is now predicted as blue this guy was predicted as blue when i take into account three neighbors it is now red so that's why hyperparameter tuning is very important your hyperparameter tuner your hyperparameter value is going to change your uh, the accuracy how well your method is doing right it's going to change the accuracy of your of your uh, estimator okay so let me stop here i'm going to continue from this point on next time hopefully next time will be a little bit faster uh, and we, we will also let you guys know when the uh, ta session will be so you have some exercises to do with with with, 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 with one of our ta's okay thank you very much for listening for two hours and uh, i hope to see you guys next time next week the same time thank you bye